Hi, this is Rachel Grumwell, Director of Programming at JW3, and I'm speaking to you from the beautiful Howard Hall, uh, which unfortunately at the moment is empty. As you know, we had to close our doors on Monday evening, but we are very much open. As you know, JW3 is not a building. It's a beautiful building, but JW3 is a project with a vital mission and vision. And now more than ever, we want to bring stimulation, inspiration and comfort powered by Jewish values, learning and life into your homes. So we're working really hard on digital programming for the coming months. JW3 TV, as you will have seen. Meanwhile, we've uploaded some of the best of our archive content from the last six and a half years, so please enjoy. This content's free, but as you can imagine, this is a difficult time for us financially, so if you can donate to keep us going, to keep a uh, cross-communal space where everybody is welcome in play and healthy for the future, please do so. Enjoy! So, as I was saying earlier to uh, some people, this evening was set in motion two years ago uh, when a colleague of mine, Michael Leventhal, uh, reconnected me with um, Andrew Roberts and said that uh, there's a book in the being prepared, um, not hadn't started writing yet, um, and you know we should get together on it. And two years later, here we are on the stage. Really exciting, and thank you so much for honouring that email from two years ago. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome such a distinguished speaker to JW3, and seeing so many regulars in the audience this evening uh, is a delight. I have to tell you, Andrew and Richard, that there are people in this audience who were here this morning or at lunchtime and lots who are back tomorrow morning so they are all, um, really making an effort to come out in an evening as well um, it, it, and, and thank you all for doing so um, and if there are new people to JW3 in the audience as well a special welcome to you and I hope you'll also become regulars um, there will be a chance to ask questions from the floor later in the evening and there'll be a roving mic um, with our wonderful ushers who will come to you so that everyone can hear. So please do wait until you have a mic in front of you. Um, our thanks to West End Lane Books and Heidi who have come to uh, sell the books tonight and um, Andrew's very kindly agreed to sign them afterwards as well. And that of course applies to those of you who already bought um, one earlier in the evening, you can also have it signed. Um, so Andrew then suggested um, Richard Cohen to be in conversation with, uh, and thank you Richard for agreeing to come. Um, Richard is a, has studied legal history and international law, he's been in interested in history forever, and he's also a veteran member of the Board of Deputies uh, and was a candidate for the pres presidency uh, three years ago. Um, I think I'm going to hand over now. Um, I just want to take this opportunity in case I forget at the end to thank our wonderful staff, our technician this evening, Roy, who will make sure that you can hear everything, and Sophia, um, our duty manager and her staff, because the, the uh, evening would not run nearly so smoothly without them, and um, I'm you know, very grateful. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Um, a special thank you to Andrew Roberts, of course, and I should say that today, very excitingly, the book has entered into the top ten in the Sunday Times Best Seller list. <laughs> so thank you, and Richard, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Judy, and a very warm welcome to everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. So, when, you, when we're dealing with a gentleman who lived for 90 years, we really don't want to waste too much time. So let, let's get straight in. Um, Andrew... In 2007, Martin Gilbert published a book called Churchill and the Jews, and in the acknowledgements you, you were mentioned, so perhaps you could just tell us what you, how you helped him in, in that particular publication. I think um, every Churchill scholar, um, you know that phrase about um, uh, standing on the shoulders of giants, every Churchill scholar is standing on the shoulder of one giant in particular, who is Sir Martin Gilbert. Uh, the, what he did in his eight volumes of, um, of his life of Churchill, and then also with the enormous amount of work that he put into what are now 20 volumes of uh, correspondence, um, what are called companion volumes, really make him the giant in the Churchill uh, world. And anything that, that any of the rest of us will ever do uh, really is just... Um, uh, crossing T's and dotting I's that, uh, that um, Martin Gilbert um, originally did. And you asked me how I helped him in 2007. I, c 
have no idea. I can't believe I did. Um, frankly, he, he would have uh, forgotten more about Winston Churchill than I'll ever know. Uh, of course, Winston Churchill was many things, but I always uh, consider him as a prophet. Um, and if we're comparing with a biblical character, I think Joseph is the one who springs to mind most, because, of course, when Joseph was a young boy, the age of 16, um, he predicted that both his parents and his brothers would, would one day bow down to him um, and recognize that uh, he was a man of destiny. So perhaps you could just run through with us some of the prophecies that Winston Churchill made, I believe, from a very early age. It is very important, you're right, um, Richard, very important to see Churchill as somebody who believed tremendously in his own destiny. He, uh, the reason that I've called this book uh, Walking with Destiny is that, of course, in his war memoirs um, in 1948, he wrote of the day that he became Prime Minister, Friday the 10th of May 1940, I felt as if I were walking with destiny and that all my past life were but a preparation for this hour and for this trial. And he, um, he had this sense of, uh, of, of burning personal destiny. We see it very clearly when he was 16 years old at Harrow. He was a schoolboy at Harrow. Um, Churchill was entirely self-taught, because he had to be, because he went to Harrow. <laughs> um, and he said to a school friend, um, I see great upheavals, terrible struggles, and I will be called upon to save London and save England and save the empire. And, uh, and 50 years later, all of that um, became true. It's, uh, it was only one, though, of many, many times that he uh, acted as though he, he knew that, uh, that one day that this was going to happen. And it affected everything about him. It affected not least his amazing calmness during the Second World War uh, and his sense of humor and his, uh, and his ability to, to stay, um, stay calm in crises that uh, Hopefully, none of us will ever um, begin to imagine. I believe you also made a prophecy uh, as to how the First World War would develop in the first month. He wrote a paper, and that was astonishingly accurate. Is that yes, and, and he, he actually wrote it in, I think, 1911, so a good three years before the First World War broke out. Um, the Committee of Imperial Defence, which he sat on, was uh, discussing about what Britain should do should Germany invade France. And uh, he said that we needed to uh, come in uh, with six or seven divisions immediately on the uh, left flank of the French to prevent the Germans from uh, a knockout blow to take Paris. And he said that there would be a huge battle um, that would be decisive um, in preventing the Germans from taking Paris on the 40th day of the war. And sure enough, on the uh, exact 40th day of the war, the Battle of the Marne started. It was an extraordinary sense of, um, of foresight there. But I mean, amongst many other uh, great things that he was able to predict, he did get some things terribly wrong. I, it's very important to, to remember that, I mean, this is in no sense a hagiography by book. He, um, he constantly made predictions that uh, didn't come true. In August 1941, he said that the Japanese were never going to um, attack America. He had uh, any number of things that he got wrong at the time of the Dardanelles disaster. So um, it's important to appreciate that if he was a genius, he was also a flawed genius. There is one final prophecy that I would refer to that was wildly wrong at the time, but perhaps 73 years down the line, um, it's not so uh, far-fetched after all. In the 1945 election, he said that no socialist government conducting the entire life and industry of the country could afford to allow free, sharp, or violently worded expressions of public discontent. They would have to fall back on some form of Gestapo, no doubt very humanely directed in the first instance, and this would nip opinion in the bud. It would stop criticism as it reared its head, and it would gather all the power to the Supreme Party and the party leaders, rising like stately pinnacles above their vast bureaucracies of civil servants, no longer servants and no longer civil. So. That was really wildly inaccurate as far as Clem Attlee was concerned, but um, I suppose you couldn't possibly comment upon that prediction as far as the present la Labour leadership was concerned. <laughs> yeah, it was completely ludicrous, of course, to, um, to use the word Gestapo and Attlee 
um, and uh, with regard to Clement Attlee's <coughs> government, uh, uh, sorry, opposition, later government, um, it, uh, it probably, uh, historians think that it probably cost um, the Conservatives quite a few seats, that, um, that remark. Clementine Churchill, Winston Churchill's wife, uh, begged him to take it out of the speech before he gave it. And, uh, and, and he didn't. He'd read Friedrich von Hayek's um, The Road to Serfdom, and that was the reason that he, uh, that he inserted that, uh, that absolutely um, disastrous paragraph. So just going back to his own religious beliefs, um, he wrote a long monogram about Moses, but he, in all the six million words that he wrote, he never wrote about Jesus Christ. So how do you, how do you explain all the, all, Well, because he wasn't a Christian. Um, uh, in the 5.2 million words he spoke, he never said the words Jesus Christ either. Um, he believed in an almighty um, whose sole duty, it seems, was to take care of Winston Churchill. <laughs> um, uh, theologically, it's impossible to, to see the duty of the almighty as anything further than that in, uh, in Churchill's makeup. He um, became an atheist when he was a subaltern on the northwest frontier. He wrote a he read a book called The Martyrdom of Man by Winwood Reed, who was a, a um, late Victorian author, sorry, mid-Victorian author and, uh, and atheist. And he believed that essentially all religions were the same. He didn't, um, uh, therefore, he, he had some respect for, um, for um, Jesus Christ as a sort of um, wise rabbi um, and, uh, and said that the Sermon on the Mount was one of the great... Um, last word in ethics um, but uh, but overall he um, he very much uh, he, he described himself with relation to the Church of England as being like a flying buttress in that he supported it but from the outside <laughs> <laughs> one of his heroes was Napoleon about whom I think you've written a thing or two who tried to assimilate Jews into French society rather than expel them did Churchill's philo-Semitism owe anything to Napoleon's example that's a very good uh, question. I don't know. I'm not sure whether it did. He, um, he did admire Napoleon. He uh, quoted Napoleon constantly. He had a bust of Napoleon on, on his desk pretty much throughout his life. Um, and uh, he was going to write the biography of Napoleon. Uh, I think it's one of the great, tragically unwritten books, because Churchill on Napoleon would have been a really, truly fantastic uh, book to, uh, to read. Um, and he also, at one stage, rather strangely, in 1929, suggested to Charlie Chaplin that he should make a movie about Napoleon, um, that, uh, that he, he was going to write the screenplay for, which, which could have been um, quite an amusing thing to have seen. But as far as um, Napoleon's philo-Semitism uh, philo is concerned, I'm not sure. Um, there's, there's been some new um, evidence uh, that's been unearthed saying that Napoleon actually wanted to set up a national homeland for the Jews in Palestine in 1799, mm -hmm. um, which if, um, okay. if Churchill had known about it, I feel sure that he would have uh, cited it. Mm. Churchill had quite a partial for quoting Disraeli um, in a number, of, a number of occasions when he was addressing Congress in his uh, eulogy to Neville Chamberlain. Um, I think it's because the Disraeli was the, the, the perhaps the founder of what his father established as Tory democracy. Um, perhaps you could just enlighten us here as to what, what Tory de democracy meant. Tory democracy, which <coughs> was um, uh, the, uh, the phrase, as you say, that attached to Lord Randolph Churchill's politics, and which came very much from the, uh, from the thinking and, uh, and the actions of Benjamin Disraeli, uh, was if you uh, are cynical about it, um, was highly opportunistic. It basically allowed um, Lord Randolph to change his mind on any number of occasions and uh, explain that it was uh, all just Tory democracy that uh, led him to each of his um, each of his uh, volt fast. But at, at its best, it was a, um, a philosophy of conservatism which uh, supported the um, throne and altar which wanted a strong foreign policy and a strong uh, empire, which uh, wanted as generous a provision for the poor and the old as could be um, paid for from a, uh, from a booming economy that was based essentially on free trade. The, the, uh, the reason that mid-Victorian 
um, British economy went did so well. And uh, so it uh, it had um, it, it called itself um, in, Imperium et Libertas, uh, Empire and Liberty, and tried to meld those two things together. Um, into a coherent uh, political philosophy. It was um, something that Churchill stuck to and, uh, and supported all his life, even when he was a liberal, which he of course was for 20 years between 1904 and 1924. And uh, in that time he saw this, the, and, and he and David Lloyd George set up the beginning of the welfare state, and he saw that as being very much part of the Tory, Tory Democrat um, commitment to um, social reform, um, as, as wide social reform as could be um, afforded by the state. The church also was quite fond of quoting Disraeli as having said that the Lord treats the nations as the nations treats the Jews. So I'm wondering whether there was something perhaps a little bit opportunistic about Churchill's um, philo-Semitism, especially as he advised Hitler that um, anti-Semitism was a good starter but a bad sticker. Um, was there any element to, of his opposition to the Aliens Bill when he was first cutting his teeth? That I think it was a... I, I mean, he represented um, uh, Manchester North West, yeah. which was a very heavily, uh, I think about one third of the constituents were Jews. Mm. Um, but, uh, but no, his, his uh, philosemitism comes back from far earlier than his time as a politician. It came from his father. Um, who was friendly with Jews, uh, who liked the company of Jews, who ensured therefore that Churchill went on holiday as a, as a teenager um, with Jews. And uh, of course it also, in a sense, fitted in with this, um, with, with this deism that he had, because the Almighty, at one point, he does say that, the, um, that the, all the greatest uh, ethics come from from the Jews. Uh, he, he writes that in an article in uh, 1920. So um, this is something that, um, that is inherent in him rather than something that he did in order to uh, get on politically. In fact, if anything, um, the opposite is the case because so many of the people of his age and, uh, and background, especially social background, were anti-Semites. Um, the anti-Semitism was rife amongst the British upper classes in the uh, late Victorian period. And so actually to uh, stick out and be friendly towards the Jews as, uh, as his father had been was something that, um, as Martin Gilbert points out uh, very often in his book Churchill and the Jews, actually was something that was held against him and um, held up as an example of his bad judgment. Uh, it, was it, was, it was that bad. Of course, Churchill was also half American, and I think he was considered to be something of an outsider for that reason, and that may have given him a, a greater understanding of other outsiders. Perhaps, yes. Uh, the, um, although his, um, his American mother, of course, came over to England in her, um, in her late teens and, uh, and stayed here, the, the actual um, level of Americanness in, uh, in Churchill, I think, is something that's rather over, overrated, frankly. So, often now, often when one is having a discourse about Churchill these days, the subject of India looms very large, but I don't actually want to con uh, concentrate on the Bengal fa famine for the moment anyway. But I would like to I ask... I don't mind if we do, I mean, it's, <laughs> no, I mean seriously, this is, this is one of the great canards of, um, yeah. of uh, Churchill, um, uh, the, the trolling of, of Churchill and anybody who stands up for Churchill on social media and Twitter and the rest of it is um, this assumption um, that because Churchill occasionally made jokes about Indians, jokes that we would not countenance today in a million years, um, but in those days uh, were not considered completely outrageous because um, he was born in 18, he was born 144 years ago uh, when Darwin was still alive and racism was, was considered a scientific fact. It's obscene and ludicrous to us today, but it wasn't in those days. And he did make these jokes. The idea that therefore he would be in favour of genocide against, um, against three million or so um, Bengalis is completely and utterly bilge. Because what happened with um, Bengal was that an enormous uh, cyclone hit it in October 1942 
uh, which swept away the rice crop on which the Bengalis lived, swept away the roads and railways that they um, that were needed to bring rice in at exactly the same time that the Japanese were in charge of uh, and had taken uh, Burma, Thailand, and Malaya, which is where the rice usually came from when this kind of thing happened. And of course, they weren't going to sell it to us. And they had uh, submarines in the Bay of Bengal and also had been shelling the eastern Indian cities. And then you have problems, major problems, between the um, uh, provinces and very uh, lacklustre, stroke negligent behaviour by the Viceroy. None of this is, is Winston Churchill's fault, and yet he's, for some reason, uh, consistently blamed by the um, anti-Churchill fanatics that seem to um, infest social media. And just going back to the Amritsar massacre, because not only did he <coughs> defend the weaponless uh, Indians that were killed by General Dyer's uh, soldiers, but he also, in a, in a way, defended Edward Montague as well. He rescued him in a debate in Parliament. Yes, the Jewish um, Secretary of State for India, Edwin Montague, was being attacked by um, anti-Semitic Conservative MPs. And uh, Churchill, uh, who was still in the Liberal Party, of course, at that stage, um, came to his defence and, uh, and saw them off, frankly, and uh, denounced the Amritsar massacre in, um, in no uncertain terms. So, uh, again, this is, um, this is a, another example of... Um, of the trolling that, uh, that Churchill gets, because people on, um, on Twitter seem to think that he was in some way responsible for the Amrits and Alaska, or defended it, but the exact opposite is the case. Yeah. So, Churchill met Heim Weizmann in the early 1900s, and then again during the First World War, um, and although Churchill was not a party to the, the drafting of the Balfour Declaration, because he wasn't in the War Cabinet at the time, um, he became colonial secretary in 1920, and his visit to Palestine with T.E. Lawrence, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, radically changed his uh, opinions about Palestine. Could you just give us some, some indication of the way in which Churchill's Zionism developed? Well, um, Weizmann was, of course, a uh, central figure in the, um, in the development of Churchill's Zionism. He, um, uh, he liked Weizmann, um, he appreciated very much what Weizmann had done um, at the Admiralty in the, uh, in the Great War, and he also had a, um, a, a, a sense that the um, Jewish people in Palestine, could, especially of course at a time when the um, Palestinian Arabs had, uh, had borne arms for the Turkish um, uh, Ottoman Empire, um, were people who, um, who could be um, helpful to the Allies and, and supportive of the Allies during, uh, during this completely terrifying and terrible um, life and death struggle. And so by the time he, um, he became colonial secretary, uh, he was, was again completely out of kilter with the huge majority of, um, of British officialdom and most British um, politicians in wanting to, um, to advance, to actually put teeth onto the Balfour Declaration, which as you say, he didn't, uh, he didn't uh, draw up, but he was hugely in favour of um, in, the, um, in November 1917. Yeah, um, and just want to have a word about Churchill's method methodology. Um, in 1917, it seems that almost everyone in the British public affairs was in favour of uh, a Jewish state within Palestine, but by 1922, a lot of them had completely changed their minds. And Churchill really seems to have done an enormous amount of homework when he made a speech in the House of Commons, quoting back at those people that had changed their minds what they'd previously said. Um, this was when he was speaking in favour of the Rutenberg concession to um, harness the, the Yarkon and the Jordan rivers in Israel. So can you just perhaps give us an indication of how much preparation Winston Churchill made when he um, made parliamentary speeches? Well, he always knew how important speeches uh, were to him. Uh, even at the age of 23, before he'd even given a major speech, he wrote an article um, that actually ultimately was never published, just as well for him was never published, called The Scaffolding of Rhetoric, in which he explained that it was very important 
uh, to follow five rules of rhetoric, um, one of which was always to exaggerate. Um, and he, and he um, would therefore, um, and, and in this extraordinary um, uh, article, which I quote from in my book, um, he said that uh, the power to make a great speech is, is greater than any power of kings or, or presidents because um, you could change people's minds and alter entire political situations just with the, with the, um, the, the power of a single voice, and, uh, which of course um, later became true during the Second World War. He therefore put an enormous amount of work into his speeches. And when you go to, to um, Churchill College archives in, uh, in Churchill College, Cambridge, and, uh, and look at his speeches, you'll see how many, um, how many drafts he goes through and how many times he crosses out certain words and has them, uh, has them uh, altered and updated. And he, was, he would spend, one uh, of his private secretaries said that he would spend as many hours on a speech as there were minutes in the speech, uh, which is an extraordinary thing. And he'd practice endlessly in front of the shaving mirror and uh, he'd try out sentences in front of his friends and family and, uh, and if they worked he'd keep them in and if they didn't, he didn't. Yeah, it's always struck me as remarkable as to how far and wide his broadcasts were heard within Europe because he gave a lot of hope to people like Anne Frank who called him her beloved Winston Churchill. I mean, she was even commenting on his energy uh, at, around the time of D-Day, the fact that he wanted to go out there and join the troops when he was nearly 70. Um, so how, how far... Well, he was desperate. The thing was, he was desperate to try and kill a German. Uh, he, 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 he had a uh, Bren gun kept in the back of his car, uh, he had a Webley 32 that he carried around with him. Um, when he went abroad he made sure that his bodyguard had an extra uh, Colt 45 for him to use if, uh, if they were attacked. He had a, um, when he went on, on journeys uh, across the Atlantic, he ensured that his lifeboat had a machine gun attached to it so that if his ship was sunk, he'd be able to fire on the U-boat that attacked his, uh, that sunk his ship. And there's a marvellous moment in, uh, in uh, the September of 1940 when the Ministry of Information gave him a speech that, um, uh, that, that he was to make on the out when the actual Germans landed on the moment of an invasion. Of course, in those days, invasion was expected uh, absolutely daily in the late summer and uh, very early autumn of uh, 1940. And, um, and Churchill did not take well to anybody sending him a, a draft of a speech. He uh, drafted his own speeches from the beginning to the end. He never used any, any um, speech writers any more than he used any spin doctors or, or focus groups or anything like that. And, um, and uh, what he, when you see this speech, right at the end, uh, he's crossed out most of it and rewritten it. And um, of course the speech was never given, but nonetheless it was ready to be used. Uh, the minute they heard that the, the, the paratroopers, the uh, German paratroopers had landed on the various airfields and so on. And the final two sentences of the uh, speech were going to be, um, as he wrote them, the time has come, kill the Hun. <laughs> just, just staying on the subject of rhetoric, because it plays an enormous role in, in uh, Jewish liturgy, in the, in the prophets, Amos and Isaiah and so on. I think Martin Luther King probably quoted more from the Jewish, the Hebrew prophets, and we did from Hebrew scripture. But there's one particular speech, which I think is far above all the others in terms of its uh, fame, and that, of course, is the we shall never surrender speech around uh, the time of Dunkirk. I wonder if you could perhaps deconstruct that for us. Yes, well, it's a, um, the, the actual paragraph that you're referring to, uh, starting we shall fight on the beaches um, through to we shall fight with ever growing confidence in the air and ending of course we shall never surrender the peroration of that amazing speech the 4th of june 1940 um he uh, he did discuss it afterwards and he pointed out how many of the words were short he always believed it was very important uh, when he'd been at harrow one of the things he had learned was what he called that noble thing the english sentence and um and he said the best thing to do when you're being direct in order to keep the clarity uh, high for your listeners is to use short words in short sentences. Um, and you look at that, uh, and also he said it was very important to try and use Old English. 
um, use words that absolutely go to the heart of, um, of the uh, listener um, because they, they're words that have been used for a thousand years. And, um, and actually when you, uh, when you look at that particular paragraph of 141 words, all but two of them do come from Old English. The two exceptions being confidence, which comes from Latin, and surrender, which comes from French. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, in the remaining 10 minutes, we do have to discuss quite portentous issues, namely uh, the white paper restricting immigration to Palestine, and also what Churchill did to try to help refugees, and what, if anything, did he do to prevent the, the terrible massacres going on in the, the death camps. Um, so perhaps if we could start with the um, immigration to Palestine, the white paper, which he, he'd opposed, um, but he didn't actually overturn it during, the, during World War II once he was in power. He tried to uh, on, on many occasions. He, of course, had uh, uh, himself supported an open door policy uh, for Jewish immigration when he was colonial secretary. This was closed down by the White Paper in 1937, which he opposed, um, and virulently opposed in the House of Commons and in the committees. Um, then he had, um, in, when he came back into power, um, but only, of course, as, uh, as First Lord of the Admiralty, he um, opposed it and tried to prevent, and tried to prevent the Royal Navy from being used to implement it. Um, and, um, but he was only one of a cabinet of 22, and when he became Prime Minister, he was the most important of a cabinet of 22, but he wasn't the dictator. Um, and the, all, every member of the cabinet, Martin Gilbert says except one, and I'm not sure who that one, is, that one extra person is, um, but all the big names, um, Kevin Tackley, Ernest Bevin, um, Anthony Eden certainly, uh, Oliver Stanley and others, believed in, um, in a ruthless um, application of the, uh, of the white paper to the point that Jews were turned away from, from Palestine even though they had been escaping from Nazi-occupied Europe. It was a, something that Churchill railed against, spoke very bravely against, constantly uh, criticised, but even as Prime Minister was unable to do anything about. And it, it, actually, if you also look at the way in which the civil service and the British Foreign Office um, uh, again, ruthlessly um, promoted this policy. It is um, certainly not uh, not their finest hour either. He he made a speech in 1946, which said that at the time during World War Two, they didn't fully comprehend the full extent of what was going on in the extermination camps. Um, what what does scholarship say about that? Um, well. The problem was that in the August, from, from July, uh, from the beginning of, um, of um, Operation Barbarossa, the attack, the, the Hitler's attack on Russia, three plus million men, 161 divisions uh, unleashed on, uh, on Russia on the night of the 21st of June, and at dawn again on the 22nd of June, 1941. Um, very quickly after that, um, you had the Einsatzgruppen coming in uh, across Russia to um, annihilate the Jews. And um, for the first six weeks, I think it must have been, until the, um, until the 6th of August, 1941, there was quite a lot of information coming out about that. But just before the Baba Yar um, massacres, 33,000 Jews uh, plus, you had um, a complete media, not media, sorry, a complete um, radio blackout. The, um, the Reich um, uh, Ministry ordered the Einsatzgruppen only to um, send messages by telephone and by um, driver, rather than motorbike, effectively, rather than over the airwaves. Uh, now, this, uh, this might have been because they thought that they would have been uh, uh, hacked, by, uh, by the Allies, but if so, why didn't they change their, um, their codes? But nonetheless, it did mean that we went into complete um, uh, sort of blackout with regard to anything that we absolutely knew about until some very brave Poles, um, including Jan Kursky, 
and um, and uh, four Jews managed to uh, get out to um, to the west and uh, and tell the truth. But um, unfortunately, by that stage, um, Auschwitz was up and running, and so was um, so were most of the other death camps. Yeah, I think those that criticise Churchill for, for not doing enough perhaps don't take into full account some of the other things he did. Just one example, he kept Spain out of the war. How did he achieve that? Well, he not only did that, but he also ensured that Franco, who wanted to close the border, the Franco-Spanish border, yeah. over the Pyrenees to Jews, to escaping Jews, um, would um, uh, he, he had that policy changed and also the policy of uh, stopping Jews from escaping into Turkey and Switzerland. But uh, I mean, it ultimately it was of course down to the Spanish Turks and, and Swiss, uh, how many they took and under what circumstances. But, um, but the blanket ban that they all imposed, um, Churchill did manage to, um, to um, have uh, repealed. But um, no, the problem, the major problem, of course, came once they had um, n had seen in March 1944 that the um, that when um, Hitler invaded Hungary and the Hungarian Jews started to be taken by train to Auschwitz, um, and the Jewish agency, uh, a a incredibly uh, brave and incredibly impressive group of people who work night and day to uh, try to minimize the uh, effects of the Holocaust came to Churchill and Eden um, with a um, with a by the 6th of July with a bulging file of, um, of, of people who were able to say what uh, was going on and how vital it was to bomb the um, railway lines going to and from um, Auschwitz um, and Churchill wrote on that minute, um, the, uh, the, the, the minute with the file, um, invoke me, uh, get anything you can out of the RAF and invoke me um, if, if necessary, which, the, um, which Eden, who was no friend to the Jews uh, at all and whose private secretary actually said, called him anti-Semitic, um, did next to nothing about. So Churchill then got on to Eka, who was in charge of the uh, Eighth Army, um, sorry, the Eighth Air Force, American Eighth Air Force, which did daylight bombing. You couldn't hit Auschwitz I at night, um, but, uh, but you could during the day. And it was the Americans who undertook uh, daylight bombing. And although it's an incredibly long way, Auschwitz, from either from Plötzi, the uh, Italian um, airfields, or of course from our own airfields here in the United Kingdom, the um, the bombing the bomber crews were were all up for it. They wanted to do it um, and uh, and to take the risk. But unfortunately, John McCloy back in Washington um, just killed it uh, again and again. He, there's a, there's a letter from his uh, to his private secretary saying kill this idea. Um, and uh, and so as I say, Winston Churchill was not a um, it was not a dictator, he wasn't able to, uh, he never once in the whole of the Second World War overruled the um, combined chiefs of staff, uh, or the British chiefs of staff either. He sort of learnt his lesson from the, um, from the Dardanelles campaign about what happens when, when you do that. Um, and so he, um, uh, he couldn't get anything done. As it was actually, only within a few days, oh, what they did do was to, was to get onto the BBC uh, which was also immensely unhelpful with over Jewish issues um, mm. uh, in the early part of the Second World War. But he got on to um, the BBC to, uh, to threaten anybody involved in the Hungarian Railway uh, Administration that they would be um, put on trial for war crimes if they continued to do this. And they also um, made various other threats to, uh, to the Hungarian government. And the um, the shipping of the Jews from Hungarian Jews to Auschwitz uh, ended in um, early August. Mm. So of course Winston Churchill was a complete nemesis for Adolf Hitler. He, he uh, completely obsessed and preoccupied with Churchill. I think he described him as being fat, a fat, lazy drunkard, uh, kept afloat by Jewish gold. So can you? I mean, we know that he was fat. He definitely wasn't lazy, but perhaps you could just. Well, I don't think he was a drunkard it. either. Um, right. He uh, he drank an enormous <laughs> amount, uh, undoubtedly. Um, 
T.P. Scott said that Winston Churchill couldn't have been an alcoholic because no alcoholic could have drunk that much. Um, and uh, and he, uh, he kept his, uh, his blood alcohol level at a pretty level um, almost all throughout the war, um, but certainly in the, in the, uh, in the afternoons and, and uh, early and late evenings. Um, but Hitler uh, also believed that he was, that Churchill, as you mentioned, was, uh, was financed by Jewish gold. In fact, um, Sir A. Bailey, I think it was, or maybe, St no, Sir Henry Strakoch it was, uh, who uh, died in 1944 and left Churchill the um, equivalent of one million pounds in today's money. Um, and uh, it rather undermines those anti-Semites um, like David Irving and, uh, and others who said that uh, the Jews only supported Churchill because of what they could personally get out of it. I think if you leave money in your will, you're clearly not trying to get anything out of it. So, could we just move on to the 1945 uh, defeat? Um, how differently would things have turned out in Palestine if Churchill won that election? Um, oh, very differently indeed, because, um, because Ernest Bevin wouldn't have been um, Foreign Secretary, and Ernest Bevin was no friend to the Jews, and actually uh, neither was Clement Attlee, frankly. When you read the letters that he writes to his, uh, during this period, during the 48 and 49, at the Bodleian Library in Oxford, uh, that he writes to his uh, brother, um, he, he makes some, um, some remarks that, uh, that tip, in my view, very much into anti-Semitism. Um, Churchill, on the other hand, uh, would have um, had a big fight on his hands um, with regard to, um, to Palestine, of course, with the um, same people who, during the war, caused so much um, trouble, the, um, the Foreign Office, which was, would have been under Anthony Eden, um, and, the, and the rest of the cabinet. But um, to have had a Prime Minister who was instinctively uh, in favour of a national homeland for the Jews in, in Palestine would have been tremendously helpful, I think, in, uh, in all sorts of things, not least, of course, in getting early recognition for Israel. Well, we've got about three minutes left now. I'd just like to lighten up a bit before we throw it open to questions. Um, one of the things that Winston Churchill shares in common with Donald Trump is that they both have Jewish son-in-laws. I'm talking about Vic Oliver. So how, how did Churchill get on with Vic Oliver? Um, well done for finding something he has in common with Donald, Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> um, I had no idea how that sentence was going to end. Um, you don't have to. No. Uh, Vic Oliver, well, he had a problem with Vic Oliver. It wasn't because Vic Oliver was Jewish. It was because Vic Oliver was um, Austrian. And he knew that, um, that uh, uh, we were going to be going to war with Austria uh, sooner rather than later when he married... Uh, Sarah um, Churchill's daughter in 1936, Christmas 1936, and so he worried that she was therefore going to become a naturalised Austrian, and be um, uh, and maybe if she was caught in the wrong place at the wrong time when war broke out, um, maybe actually could be um, um, interned. So, so he was he was concerned about that. He also didn't really um, think terribly much of Oliver who was a banjo-playing comedian. He didn't necessarily think that that was the right person that a British aristocrat's daughter ought to be. There's a little element of snobbishness, very little, but, but, but quite enough when it comes to worrying about who your daughter's going to marry. Uh, and, um, but, uh, and he did make one of the great gags, of course, though, um, uh, which um, was about Mussolini, who, of course, shot um, Count Dino Grandi, and, uh, and um, who was his son-in-law. And uh, at the Chequers one day, um, Churchill said, which was asked which of the enemies, um, which of his enemies he most admired, and he said Mussolini. And they all said, what the hell are you talking about? You spend speech after speech pointing out what a ludicrous figure this uh, Mussolini is. He said, yes, but at least he shot his son-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, just because Jeremy Corbyn says that Jews don't understand irony. I want to talk about the Marx Brothers, um, of whom Churchill's a great fan, used to watch their films frequently. Is it true that uh, when Rudolf Hess made a, an abortive uh, peace mission to visit to the Duke of Hamilton in Scotland in 1941 and Churchill was 
told about what was happening. He said, don't, don't disturb me now, I'm watching the Marx Brothers. Is there any truth to that? It's all in chapter 28. <laughs> and then finally, is it true that he told Laurence Olivier that you're my fifth favourite actor, the first four being the Marx Brothers? <laughs> Do you know, funny enough, um, it, it, that isn't in my book, so it's probably not true. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was absolutely true. I, I actually now want to just conclude by saying one thing about Andrew Roberts that you may not know, that he belongs to a forum called the um, Friends of Israel Initiative. Um, this is made up of um, high-octane politicians like Stephen Harper, ex-Prime Minister of Canada, um, Senor Athnar of Spain, Lord Trimble, um, Colonel Kemp, and they advocate for Israel in a way that perhaps we can't. Um, for example, Richard Ingram, who was the editor of Private Eye at one time, and who is now the editor of Old, he said that he would never read a letter to a newspaper written by somebody with an obvious Jewish surname because they'd obviously be biased. And I think the marvellous thing about this Friends of Israel Forum that Andrew helped to set up, is that they can advocate things that we perhaps would not want to. I mean, that recently, uh, Colonel Kemp advocated for the, the Golan Heights uh, be uh, annexed to Israel because uh, they were obtained during a defensive war. So I think, you know, when we do give thanks to Andrew for coming along tonight, it's not just for his brilliant work and this brilliant book about Churchill, but that there is no truer and better friend of the Jewish people and Israel than Andrew Roberts. Thank you. I need to put my distance glasses on now because we're going to have some questions. There's a gentleman right at the back there. Gentleman, a gentleman on the right at the back, did you say? No, right at the back. No, right at the back, right back. sorry. Can we just have your name briefly when you speak so we can know who you are? Uh, uh, David Behrens, it's always a pleasure to hear Andrew Roberts for the reasons that Richard has said. Um, looking around without casting too many aspersions, is there anything that you think more can be done? Because as far as I'm concerned, Churchill represents all that's best about Britain. Is there anything more that can be done to make Churchill more relevant to younger people? Uh, is there a lack of understanding about the importance of Churchill and British in, in Britain's history? Should we be doing more in schools? Should we be thinking about a, yeah. an institute? Absolutely, on no, no. He, uh, 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 the, the most absolutely definitely is, not least because uh, in a survey, 20% of um, British teenagers believe Winston Churchill was a fictional character. Um, and uh, they believe, uh, it's quite an extraordinary survey, 40, I think it was 47% believe that Sherlock Holmes was a real person. Uh, and 52% and thought that Eleanor Rigby was a real person. Uh, but Churchill, on the other hand, they, um, they, they didn't believe existed. So, yes, um, go back to teaching him in schools. It's extraordinary how little he uh, crops up in the syllabus. Um, it's, uh, it's a disgrace, really, considering how important he was in British history. So I think that organizations, I'm a trustee of the International Churchill Society, um, and we do as much as we can. Churchill College uh, Archives is brilliant, and anybody who goes there will have a fascinating time learning about uh, Churchill. But frankly, there's only so much that one can do. You have lots of people going to Chartwell and an American warship just been named after Winston Churchill and so on, so on and so forth. But when it comes to the next generation knowing about him and his, and his uh, exploits and extraordinary uh, achievements, it really has to be um, taught at schools properly. And at the moment, it isn't. Just wait for the microphone, if you don't mind, sorry. <clears throat> don't need to stand up, but we'd like to know your name. My name is Jill Marcus. I wonder if you could tell us something about, if it's a myth or reality, Churchill and the Black Dog. Yes, uh, it's, it's, I believe, a myth. Um, Winston Churchill's Black Dog, i.e. his, uh, his um, supposed depression, is mentioned only once uh, in his whole life, and that is in a letter in August 1911 to, um, to his wife Clementine. 
and he uh, and at that time the phrase black dog was an Edwardian expression that we used was used by nannies and governesses for bad tempered um, children and he uh, the only other times that he got depressed were times when anyone would have got depressed such as the Dardanelles crisis and the um, and the fall of Tobruk and the fall of Singapore in 1942 but actually did proper depression is a terrible, debilitating illness. And um, the idea that um, a, a depressive could have chaired over a thousand uh, meetings of the, of the Defence Committee of the War Cabinet at any time of day or night, um, I think is, um, is, uh, is wrong. And let alone the idea of him being a manic depressive, or I've even seen some history books say bipolar. Um, that, uh, I think, is a, is a, a huge... Um, uh, it stems from an essay in 1968 uh, from a man called Anthony Stall. And, uh, but when you even look at uh, the papers of his doctor, Churchill's doctor, um, he only on five occasions mentions this depression. And as I say, you know, there were an awful lot of times in the Second World War when any Prime Minister would have been intensely depressed. Uh, yes, Simon? Yep. Wait for the microphone, sorry. Thank you. I'm Simon Henry. Uh, first of all, congratulations on your book. The Sunday Times Review said it's the best ever biography of Winston Churchill. And secondly of all, it seems to me a coincidence that we're here to talk about a guy who would no doubt have been in favour of the European Union on the very night that our fates may be sealed in Brussels. Well, first of all, about the, um, the Sunday Times and various other reviews that say it's the best um, book, that's actually what, what they said was the best single volume book. And it's very important to remember that uh, Martin Gilbert is still the, the giant in, in the sphere. Um, with regard to um, the European Union, well, Churchill was, of course, the, um, the founder of the European movement. He, he did not want uh, Teuton to fight Gaul. Uh, ever again. He'd already seen so many of his friends dying in the, um, in the Great War and the Second World War. But um, when I list them in this book, you know, it, is, it is shocking how many people who were close to him died in one of, or, 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 or one of, of those two wars. Um, and he, of course, made the great speeches about let Europe arise and, uh, and at um, the um, Zurich and the Hague and so on and so on. So, forth. so uh, he was, in what he said, a, um, a leader of the European movement. However, when he became Prime Minister in 1951 through to 1955, he didn't do anything in actual fact to, towards um, helping Britain to become part of this. He didn't join the coal and steel um, confederation or the European army idea or anything like that. He didn't move Britain at all towards um, becoming a signatory of the Treaty of Rome in 1957. So you have to, and, and he annoyed a lot of members, especially British members of the European movement. As a result, they felt incredibly frustrated about Churchill's lack of movement on this. So you have to see his, uh, his, his words on one side and his um, actions on another. There's a, there's a gentleman down here. Yeah. Malcolm Godfrey. Thank you both for an absolutely fascinating conversation. I wondered whether you thought Clementine Churchill was a significant influence on her husband, particularly in curbing some of his wilder ideas. Yes, that's a very good question. Um, she was indeed um, a, uh, a very powerful influence on him. Um, she was not uh, brought into anything to do with strategy, um, that um, you know, grand strategy and, uh, and the rest, understandably, was um, that she, she wasn't in a position to, uh, to have any input whatsoever on any of that. Um, and rightly so, she, she wasn't uh, you know, cleared at the right levels for, um, for um, involvement in any of that. However, when it came to supporting her husband, and especially at the time of the Dardanelles, Catastrophe. There's an incredibly moving letter which she writes to um, to Asquith, the Prime Minister, who's just effectively sacked uh, Churchill, and uh, or at least moved him out of the War Cabinet and uh, and forced him to resign uh, First Lord of the Admiralty. And um, it's a letter that any man would be so proud to have a wife who who would write a letter like that. And then, of course, in June 1940, 
uh, she writes to him to say that he's being a beast to his um, to his staff and his secretaries, and he really has got to behave better. And uh, and um, yes, you know, obviously the, he had lots of things on his mind in June 1940, um, but nonetheless, um, you know, to get the best out of people, you had to be kinder to them, and and he was as a result. So yes, it's there was one. There's also one terribly moving moment where he where she understands that in order for him to retain his reputation um, when he was fighting in the trenches, he couldn't just come back to Parliament and, and give up after a couple of months. He needed to stay out there. And Churchill took amazing risks during the Great War. He went into no man's land no fewer than 30 times, got so close to the German trenches he could actually hear the Germans speaking to one another. And so in, in advising him to go back to and stay in the trenches, she knew that she was, um, she was advising him to continue risking his life, and that tore her up. But she also knew that he would not um, be able to, uh, to um, respect himself unless he was able to come back uh, with his reputation intact, ready to, uh, to take on the Ministry of Munitions. So, um, so yes, she was a very important figure in his life. Yeah, there's a gentleman in the middle there, the respectable. Simon Albert. Um, thank you for talking about his Zionism and sympathy for Jews in general. When he was Prime Minister for the second time, from 51 to 55, once Israel actually existed as a state, um, whether the Foreign Office liked it or not, can you say something about his policy towards um, Israel? We know about Eden and Suez in 56, but that was after he left office. Um, what did he actually do in office towards Israel? He, he, he insisted on Israel being treated uh, equally, um, exactly the same as every other um, independent nation, sovereign state. And, uh, and he got into some tussles with the, um, with the Foreign Office. The Foreign Office, as always, claimed and uh, stated that they had to deal with 22 Arab countries and therefore they needed to have 22 um, ambassadors, of, uh, the, 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 they had, the, basically that therefore the Arabs were 22 times more important than the, uh, than the Jews. And, um, and Churchill batted that back every time. It was, um, uh, but again, out, outnumbered. Um, there, it, it, it is, it's sh it, I still to this day find it shocking how few Zionists there were in the, um, in the non-Jewish um, uh, political classes in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. But you can count them on the fingers of one hand, basically. It's extraordinary. Uh, yes, a gentleman down here. Uh, well, front of the lady next. My name is Len Marcus. Could you tell us about his unusual relationship with his father? Yes, that's a very good question. It was uh, unusual, very unusual. Um, his father was a proud, disdainful, aloof, mercurial and in many ways brilliant um, man and politician but a terrible father um, and um, some of the letters in this book that uh, that Lord Randolph wrote to his uh, to his son when his son was only sort of 17 and 18 uh, it, 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 they, they could still incredibly moving the sheer the sheer contempt that he had for his uh, son and um, and a son who worshipped him absolutely worshipped him and who he he took no notice of except to to be rude about and unpleasant to and yet and yet um churchill continued to worship his father even after his father had died um in 1895 at the age of 45 when churchill was 20 years old and churchill from that moment on adopted his father's policies as uh, tory democrat principles as we um, have um, mentioned earlier he adopted his father's stance, the way he stood. He sought out his father's friends to talk about his father. He wrote a two-volume biography, um, a, a very positive, almost fawning biography about his father. He called his own son Randolph. Um, he had, uh, when it, Churchill was pretty much broke all the way through his life. The first time he actually got into the black was when he was in his early 70s, when he wrote, uh, he, he signed the contract for his war memoirs. And the first thing he did was, uh, when he got any money, was to um, 
by the first of 37 racehorses. Uh, and he put them, he put the jockeys in his father's racing colours. And then in 1947, when um, his daughter, Sarah, said at uh, lunch at Chartwell, there's an empty chair, who would you like, you can choose anyone to fill it, who would you like to fill it? He said, oh, my father, of course. And a few days after that, he had a, a dream, a very strange sort of psychological moment where he meets the ghost of his father and he talks about everything that had happened since his father's death. But at no point does his father find out that Winston Churchill had been a success and had won, and had won the Second World War. And instead, he thought of him as just a painter. Uh, and Churchill wasn't able to, even then, he'd spent his entire life trying to get the approbation of his dead father and he still wasn't able to tell the ghost. It's a fascinating part the, of the, the story. In the second row. Uh, hello, my name's Diana Heller. Um, my question is related to that last one. I was also going to ask about his relationship with his father, but more to the point uh, you mentioned that uh, Randolph Churchill's um, was, it was a philo science uh, you know, That's what I was curious about. If that was such a formative aspect of the subject of this talk, could you describe that a little bit more, where all of that came well, from in light of 19th century antisemitism? Yes. Um, I, it might just have been perversity. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he uh, also, of course, he was friendly with, um, with the Rothschilds, and, the Ro and, and when he died, it turned out that he owed a huge amount of money to the Rothschild Bank. Um, and uh, so, so um, uh, Nathaniel Rothschild had been, had been uh, funding his uh, political career. But um, the, uh, there's a marvellous moment when, um, uh, I can't remember the exact words of it, but, um, but it's, and it, you also see it in the wonderful movie Young Winston, uh, when his father is about to go to stay at an English aristocratic country house. And, uh, and some anti-Semitic uh, aristocrat said, uh, you haven't brought any of your Jews with you then, Lord Randolph? And Randolph Churchill said, no, you know how easily bored they get. <laughs> <laughs> that was based on a true story. Gentlemen at the back. And then, um, yes. Hello, my name's Andy Finkel. I wanted to query one or two things you said. You said that Churchill couldn't overrule the Chiefs of Staff. Yet, my well, he, he could, but he didn't. Um, he decided not to. He was Minister of Defence, so he could. He could sack them all, on, you know, on, on a particular day if he wanted to. But he'd learnt the lessons of the Dardanelles, and so he never did. Well, I, I don't want to delve into a big debate on this because it's only tangential to my main question. But, um, the point I was going to say is, my understanding is it was Churchill who drove the idea that British troops should go into Greece in. 1941, when the military people thought they should stay in North Africa? No. Um, G General Dill, the Chief of the Imperial General Staff, was in favour of the Greek expedition. Everything that uh, we did was okay by the Chief of Staff. You'll, uh, as I say, it'll, okay, well, the details are in the book. I wanted to ask was, on a scale of 1 to 10, how realistic would you say the film Darkest Hour was? <laughs> well, look, I, that's a good question. I, I, I loved Darkest Hour. I really did. I, I, quite beyond the prosthetics that uh, Gary Oldman had, which did make him look just like Churchill. Uh, also, he had this um, the twinkle in the eye and the, and, the, and the capacity of joking and all the uh, other sides of, um, of Churchill, which I thought were, were, were great. Um, the underground scene was, of course, ludicrous, um, and, uh, and so was the scene where the king came to visit him in number 10 Downing Street in his bedroom at midnight. Uh, I'm sure you that doesn't happen either. Um, but the trouble with the underground scene, it strikes me, is not just the, um, the, the ridiculous sort of Hollywood political correctness that was uh, involved in it, but also that it undermined um, the true situation, which was that Churchill didn't go to focus groups and, and the public or MPs uh, or the king or anybody to ask um, whether or not we should fight on against Adolf Hitler. He knew that we shouldn't and he led. He led from the front. He, he didn't uh, feel the need to, um, to get uh, any kind of approbation from um, a bunch of people on a tube train. 
Um, that's that was that is the that's the problem with that uh, film. However, having said that, my wife refuses now to go to any history movies with me. <laughs> she she says I'm, I'm just a, such a terrible peasant. All I do is tusk all the time. <laughs> well, before before we leave the subject of movies, we're very honoured tonight to have the historical advisor to the film Dunkirk, uh, Joshua over there. So, um, would you like to pose a question to uh, Andrew? I love that movie too, by the way, it's fantastic. You don't have to say that, but thank yeah, no, you. No, no, I did. But uh, I, I won't talk about that. We'd have your full name for the Yes, audience. Joshua Levine. Um, thank you very much, absolutely fascinating. I just want to turn the, uh, my question towards a special relationship, um, the so-called special relationship, because um, we, we're sometimes led to believe nowadays that it's somehow organic and, and written in the stars, and it, would, you know, it, it, it goes back to time immemorial. Um, without... Churchill's overtures to Roosevelt. Would, could there be any such thing as a, as a special relationship, do you think? Well, I think it did predate him, of course. Um, Lord Salisbury uh, got on well with, he was the first person to, to try to have uh, positive um, uh, relations with the United States. And, um, and in the First World War, they had, of course, ultimately come to, uh, to, come to the aid of Europe and um, and put uh, over a million men onto the Western Front. So, so uh, you know, there, we did have good relations before, but they fell into total uh, disrepair <laughs> in the 1920s, um, partly because of their insistence on debt uh, reparations um, uh, being paid to the last uh, to the last penny, and partly because they were building a, uh, a massive um, fleet. Um, and uh, that was felt, even by Churchill actually, privately, um, to um, maybe one day threaten the Royal Navy, the primacy of the Royal Navy. So, um, and Churchill actually came out with a few quite anti-American remarks, but did it at Chartwell that you find them in, in diaries, you don't see them, he certainly never said anything in public at all. Um, and then in the, um, I haven't spoken at all about the new sources for this book, but one of the most important, if not the most important, new source that I've been allowed was that the Queen has let me um, be the first Churchill biographer to use her father's diaries. And, um, and the King and Churchill met every Tuesday. Uh, they had lunch together. They served themselves from the sideboard because the, because the servants couldn't be there, owing to the fact that they were talking about the ultra-secret, the nuclear secret, where Churchill intended to attack, various generals he, he intended to sack, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and one of the things that uh, they discussed was Churchill's intense frustration that the Americans weren't getting more involved um, in, in, the, um, in the war and weren't helping more than they were, uh, and how long it took to get Len Lease through, and you know, the obsolete uh, destroyers that we bought, and all the rest of it. Churchill um, saw this as a war for civilization, um, and, um, and, and so he expected the Americans to be, uh, to be more um, proactive. And one of the reasons that he saw it as a war for civilization was indeed his philosemitism, because he, it was his philosemitism that allowed him to spot early on, it was a sort of early warning system for him, which a lot of the other people in uh, the House of Commons didn't have, especially the anti-Semitic uh, members on the Tory and, and national government benches. Um, because uh, he was therefore able to see the Nazis and uh, Adolf Hitler for what they were um, earlier than anybody else. And without his spider semitism I don't think he'd have necessarily been able to have done that. I think it was uh, US President Calvin Coolidge who said that the business of America is business, and I would take that further and say the business of life is business. We've got to get down to the business of book signing in a minute. But we've got four minutes left, so gentlemen with the blue shirt, Can you hear me? Uh, Tom Horvath, on your last point, um, when did Churchill know we were going to war? Where would we be without him? And what do you attribute to his greatness? How did he reach those heights? Golly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he feared that we were going to sell out Poland on the 1st of, um, sept of September 1939. So he actually only knew we were definitely going to go to war on the 3rd of September, on the same day that he became First Lord of the Admiralty. Um, what was the second question, sorry? 
Um, we would uh, be in a very, very dark place now without him because uh, had he not been Prime Minister in late May 1940, there's a very good chance that the British establishment would have made peace with Adolf Hitler. Uh, he was the key figure in the war cabinet that prevented that from happening. Lord Halifax wanted it, Brad Butler wanted it, uh, Neville Chamberlain probably could have been persuaded. And if we had, if we had done that, then Hitler would have been able to have attacked Russia with 100% of the Luftwaffe rather than with um, 50 to 70% of it. And when you think that um, in Russia, Hitler subjected Leningrad to a grueling thousand day siege, he got to the underground stations of Moscow, he took Stalingrad um, with the whole of the, um, of the Luftwaffe rather than having almost half of it um, kept back in the West to defend German cities against the RAF, later the USAAF. Um, he could well have pushed the Russians beyond the Urals, and then he'd have dominated the whole of, um, of Europe, and, uh, and our time would have come uh, uh, soon after that. So, um, for the, and, and when you look actually at the, uh, where he was going to send the Einsatzgruppen when he um, captured these islands, they were going to have um, extermination centres all over the United Kingdom, but certainly, of course, also in places like Dublin. So the, um, the so-called uh, neutrality of Ireland was not going to be respected by the Nazis either. And the entire Jewish population of the United Kingdom would have been wiped out. I think we've just got time for the vote of thanks now, and then we'll get down to business. <laughs> oh, sorry. And there was a, was there a third question, which I'd like to, to end on a slightly more upbeat um, uh, thing. And what was, what, what was that last one? So? His greatness. The ex explanation for his greatness. Yeah. Okay. His greatness came from a, uh, a, a fantastic collection of virtues that, uh, that he had. Virtues um, that included extraordinary eloquence. Um, as I say, from the age of 23, he had analyzed public speaking and he made thousands of speeches. He traveled tens of thousands of miles in order to do it. Um, and, uh, and he'd been doing it for four, over 40 years by the time he became prime minister. So wonderful eloquence immense clarity of, uh, of vision, a, um, a, a willingness to learn from his mistakes. He made many, many mistakes. This is no hagiography, ladies and gentlemen. He got women's suffrage wrong, he got the gold standard wrong, he got the abdication crisis wrong, he got the Dardanelles wrong, but he learned from all of them. Um, a, so foresight and clarity and a willingness to, um, to learn from his uh, mistakes. And lastly, courage. Amazing physical courage, of course, putting his life in danger again and again, especially during the Blitz. Um, there are some amazing stories in this book about him going up onto the air ministry roof and, and people begging him not to, but he wanted to be at the important place at the important time. But far more important even than his uh, incredible physical courage was his moral courage and his willingness. Uh, part of it, I think, stems from his being an aristocrat. And in those days, you know, if you're the grandson of a duke and you're born in a palace, you didn't really care terribly much what other people thought of you. <laughs> and, uh, and thank God that Churchill didn't, because he was, uh, he was attacked, he was lambasted, he was called a war, a warmonger. They, people criticized his judgment because he liked Jews, etc. And he didn't care. He kept saying what he believed. And these are, um, these are political values and political uh, qualities that have always been important in history, probably actually are needed now more than ever before, uh, and ones that will, I think, um, uh, really um, endure, and thank God Winston Churchill had all of them. There we are, we've ended on a positive <laughs> note. So, so thank you so much for, for raising us back up. Um, it's not an evening that an, an, in often that an evening surpasses every expectation, but you really did this evening. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for such a fabulous evening. Richard, thank you for chairing and interviewing so well. Please join me in welcoming.